Greetings, everyone. It's Professor Fiore, and today we are going to talk about the all pass filter. What is an all pass filter? Well, the name might be a little confusing. You've heard of high pass filters, low pass filters, band pass filters. Those names describe the section of the spectrum, the frequency spectrum, that it allows through, implying that there are other sections that it stops, it prevents. So all pass would imply that it allows all frequencies through. And in fact, that is what this filter does. This has a gain of unity or zero dB across the entire frequency spectrum. What it does do, unlike a simple, let's say buffer, is it produces a phase shift. Now, before we go any further, if you have not watched the video on the adjustable inverter, non-inverter amplifier, you might want to watch that first because this circuit and that circuit are very similar. Really the difference being that the inverter non-inverter has a potentiometer over here instead of this resistor and capacitor. The cool thing is they both use the inverting and non-inverting inputs of the op amp, right? That's something we typically don't do with circuits. So there are certain parallels, if you'll excuse the pun, between those two circuits. So you might want to take take a moment and look at that other one first. Now, this happens to be the lead version. If you look at C1 and R3 here, this forms a lead network. There is also a lag version of this where the two components are swapped. That guy right there, okay? And they are complementary in how they work they both produce phase shift. In the case of this lag version, it produces a lagging phase shift at the output from zero to a negative 180 degrees. At the critical frequency, in other words, using our usual one over two pi RC equation with R3 and C1, we see half of that minus 90 degrees. Basically, you get twice the value that you would expect out of a single lag network. So this, just like a normal lag network that you would plot, you know, using a Bode plot, the actual phase shift depends on the frequency. This is not a fixed shift. It's not, um, you know, always minus 90 or always, you know, minus 17.5 or whatever the heck. It varies through the spectrum. The lead version of this, as you might expect, produces a leading phase shift at the output in this case from 180 to zero, right? So you got 180 to zero and basically zero to minus 180, all right? 90 degrees at the critical frequency. Again, same sort of deal. Here you can see this is a lead network, right? Cap up front, resistor on bottom. And over here, we have resistor up top, cap on bottom, right? So this is the position you would usually see the shunting position for the capacitor being a lag network and the sort of coupling kind of position here where the signal goes through the cap to get to the input, that's the typical lead position, all right? Okay, so let's take a look at the kind of phase shift, the kind of signal you might get out of here. So first, I've set up the resistor and capacitor value, C1 and R3. I've set these up for a critical frequency of uh, one kilohertz, all right? So if you plug 10 nanofarads and 15.9, uh, K ohms into this equation, your FC will come out to be one kilohertz. And I've set my input for a one kilohertz, one volt peak sine wave. So let's see what it does, right? This is supposed to produce a 90 degree phase shift. So we'll just do a little transient analysis over here and we'll see what we got. Expand that out a little bit. All right, so the green is the generator and the maroon is the load. And you can see, it's very easy to see over here, that that's a, clearly a leading signal. And if you just look at the spacing we have over here, right, that is in fact half, this, this lead is basically half of one of these divisions, and it's two divisions per cycle, so that's a quarter uh, of the full cycle, in other words, 90 degrees, right? Beautiful, looks good. Now let's flip over to the other one, and I'm using the same resistor and cap value, so this will also be a 90 degree shift, but again, this is the lag version. Let 
and get the legend down here. So there's our generator and we can see, yes, the maroon, the load is in fact lagging. And again, we can see that it's sitting here at, you know, minus 90 degrees. So, so far so good. But you know, an easier way to, to visualize what's going on here is to look at a Bode plot for one of these. So in the lead case, let's go back to the lead. We can just come in and uh, do an AC transfer characteristic. And I'm gonna run from 10 Hertz up to 10 megahertz. And we'll be able to see a couple of things here. We're gonna do uh, both amplitude and phase. So first we'll be able to see that the amplitude is in fact zero dB or unity across the entire band. And secondly, we'll be able to see what the phase shift looks like. All right, so here's our gain part of it, or at the amplitude. And we can see that that is nice and flat. We're down here at 10 Hertz. And this is going out to, you know, pretty much the upper limit of the op amp. Uh, a 081 has an F unity of somewhere in the vicinity of two, three megahertz. And we can check just where this thing is peeling off. So here we are at uh, virtually zero. So I'm gonna be looking for my minus three point over here. And we're right around there. So 1.77 megahertz. All right, so we're getting the full range of the amplifier. Now take a look at the phase shift, all right? So this is supposed to go from plus 180 to zero. If you look careful, you see that this is at the very high frequency starting to decrease even further. This over here is just due to the internals of the op amp, right? This op amp does not extend uh, its, its gain performance out to infinity. So when I say this goes from plus 180 to zero, I mean within the expected range of usage. In other words, where the gain part, the magnitude of the gain is still flat. So for us, that's up to, you know, several hundred kilohertz. And that's essentially what we're seeing here. So this is just sort of a non-ideal thing. But let's go check what the extremes on this phase shift happen to be. So here we are at the bottom end, and we're just sitting about 180. I come out here, we're sitting around uh, that was milli degrees, so about zero down here. And as I said, I tune this to one kilohertz, so we should be getting twice what we would see in a simple lead network, which would be 45. Here we should be seeing about 90. So tweak that. Okay, 1K, 1K hertz, and we're getting 90.017, right? So we're, we're right there. Beautiful. Now let's turn around and do the same sort of thingy with the lag counterpart. Okay, so here's our gain again. We can see it's pretty much the same scale. There's minus five, so minus three is gonna be over here. Once again, we're gonna be up in that two-ish megahertz range. And we can see the phase shift is running from zero, right down through, and here's, here's where we're hitting 180. And again, we're getting that effect, that nine ideal effect, that band limiting effect at the highest end where that face sort of peels off even further. But just to verify, we'll go through here, right? So we are, and that flat part, we are hitting about minus 180. And once again, at one kilohertz, we should be sitting at a negative 90. And we're sitting at minus 89.98. We're sitting at minus 90. Beautiful, okay? Now, what happens if you put in a different frequency? Well, you're gonna get a different phase shift, all right? So if we go back to a transient analysis, like I come over here and I say, all right, let's, let's change my sine wave from uh, you know, one kilohertz to, I don't know, let's just use two kilohertz, right? We are not gonna see that same phase shift. We're not gonna see that exact 90 degree phase shift. All right, now I'm gonna drop this down to two millise uh, milliseconds. Okay, well, you can see, all right, here's our gen, there's our V load. The lag here is not, you know, if it was exactly 90, we'd be, we'd be sitting at a peak right over here. So this is definitely pushed beyond. And, you know, the farther we go, the greater that effect will be. I mean, after all, we are looking at, essentially this curve, we've moved up to here. We were at one kilohertz, now we're at two kilohertz. So we do expect that to see that phase shift growing more and more negative, lagging more and more, and that's exactly what we're seeing, right? It was peaking back here, 
Now it's peaking a little further along. The important thing is wherever we want, for example, quadrature, wherever we want that, we can get it just by playing with these values. You know, I can tune this just like any other simple RC circuit. So if I want to get a, a, an appropriate phase shift down at uh, 100 hertz, it's just a matter of adjusting the resistor and or capacitor to get that. Now, when you start thinking about, you know, a 100 degree phase shift down at 50 hertz or something, you know, now we're talking milliseconds, many milliseconds of uh, potential time shift. And that can actually be useful for certain kinds of, um, like audio effects, for example. You can use that, especially if you uh, made this dynamic. You know, if I had a potentiometer over here, I could swing this thing back and forth, and that would create a moving phase shift. And if you're thinking, hey, guitar player, phase shifter, yeah, that would be sort of step one in building something like a phase shifter. That would be kind of like a manual phase shifter. All right. We could enhance this. You know, we could put in some kind of... Um, voltage controlled resistance, like maybe a, uh, a JFET in ohmic region, control that with an oscillator. Um, we could have multiples of this, cascade them so I can get different phase shifts at different frequencies. Uh, lots of possibilities there, all right? Uh, essentially the way it's working though is when you're coming in here, you got two paths to deal with. One is what I'll call the straight path going through RI and RF, the sort of inverting path. The other is through the RC network, right? Either lag or lead. And that will adjust both the amplitude and the frequency, the, excuse me, the, the amplitude and the, and the phase of the input signal at some frequency, all right? So if we were to think, for example, oh, let's go to a really high frequency in this circuit, what ends up happening? What do you have? Well, this cap, the X sub C would be zero, right? It would be a short. So you would bring the plus input right to ground. What do you then have? Well, basically, you just have an inverting amplifier. You get the shift of minus 180 degrees at high frequencies. Okay, you get this guy up here. But at really low frequencies, this thing opens up. And what you end up having is essentially R3 just feeding directly into pin three of the op amp, the non-inverting input. Well, what ends up happening in that case? You actually wind up with just a gain of one non-inverting amplifier, like a buffer. Now, if that's not direct, directly obvious to you, I would refer you back to that inverting, uh, non-inverting adjustable amplifier video, but I'll go through it very quickly here. The thing to remember is that even though this is an inverting appearing configuration, that doesn't mean that this node right here, pin two of the op amp, the inverting input, is necessarily at a virtual ground like it would be in an like it would be in an inverting amplifier. Let's get that out. What we have is a secondary input through R3. We're using both inputs. So we can't say that this thing is necessarily uh, sitting at virtual ground. In fact, what we do know is that the error voltage, the difference between the inverting and non-inverting inputs, must be pretty close to zero. Right? Once, you have, once you've applied negative feedback, that must be the case. So we're going to get some signal right, over through here. Like I said, at really low frequencies, this is an open. So basically what you get at pin 3 of the op amp is VGen. Why? Well, this current is going to flow through R3, and that current into the op amp is ideally zero. In fact, that's gate current going into this op amp, a 081 is a, is a JFET input op amp. So this input current is nil. What does that mean? That means the voltage drop, Ohm's law, across R3 is nil. So yes, VN, V generator, whatever you want to call it, applied right here. So this voltage and this voltage are the same, virtually the same. And because the error voltage must be the same, then the voltage at the inverting input must also be a volt. So if that's the case, if this is a volt and this is a volt, the drop across our I must be zero. There's virtually no current flowing through our I. Well, if there's no current flowing through our I and there's no current in or out of this op amp pin, then the current through RF must also be zero.
If it wasn't, you'd have violated Kirchhoff's current law. Well, if this current is zero, then the drop across the RF must also be zero. What does that mean? It means that the voltage at the load must be the same as this voltage right here at pin two, which we know is the same as the voltage at pin three, which we know is the input. Bingo, you have a gain of one and no phase shift. You just have a single, single gain of one plus one, right? That's it, unity, buffer, that's what you got. And then as we go in between, Right as we go in between, um, I go to a higher frequency, lower frequency. I start shifting things around. You know, maybe X sub C one is uh, you know minus J five K or something like that. We'll get some voltage lost across R three, and some will make it to here. End result will be um, that same voltage at pin two, but that means there'll now be a current here because this pin and this pin won't be at the same potential. So there will be a current here and there will be a current going through RF and we can still take that potential, add it to the pin two potential and that'll be the output. But there was a phase shift, right? Caused by R and C. So we therefore expect the output to have some phase shift, right? And that's what we see right on this plot. And the same thing happens over in the original circuit in the lead, in the, um, lead version of this, right? At, at a really high frequency, C1 shorts out, this pin goes right to the input. So there's your in, in, and what do we end up with? Okay, well, we end up with that buffer again. At really low frequencies, this thing opens up, and all we have is this pin going essentially through 15.9K to ground. We just have an inverting amplifier. Okay, so we're back to that other extreme. There you go. Now, as I said, you can combine these things, you can add more, you can sum them into a summing amplifier. There's uh, a lot of cool stuff you can do with this, okay? But it's kind of an interesting thing. It has a weird name, all pass filter. So remember, you hear that all pass, all pass filter, it's used for adjusting phase or timing, right? Another place, I'll just leave you with this one because I know some of you are audio freaks like me, audiophiles. You can use this for time alignment in uh, an active crossover network. You can get a little time delay and help align various transducers in a system. Okay. Alrighty. Any questions? Put them in the comments and I'll see you later.